Good evening, Cedar Rock. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we're back in 1 Thessalonians. Tonight we're going to be uh, finishing up chapter 4, so getting close to the end. Uh, so go ahead and open your Bibles there, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. While you're doing that, let me pray for us to start our time together tonight. Father, thank you for your word. God, it is powerful. It speaks. Uh, it convicts. It pierces our hearts. Uh, so, Lord, give us ears to listen, hearts to obey you tonight, Father, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, once, as I was walking through uh, a parking lot or something, maybe I was behind this car on the interstate, I noticed um, uh, a tag hanging down from the windshield of this car, and it said, warning, in case of rapture, this car will be unmanned. I thought that was pretty funny at the time, and uh, I think it reflects in some way the way that uh, the rapture, the idea of the rapture, has made it into pop culture. Uh, we've got uh, books like the Left Behind series, even movies that are based off of them uh, that feature this idea of the rapture. Uh, clearly, it's an important piece of theology. Uh, even some systems that, um, you know, help interpret the end times, the rapture is a, a big feature of these systems that other points depend on. Uh, in some circles, you might even hear people uh, calling themselves like a, a pre-trib or a mid-trib or a post-trib. So, um, you know, we could ask what a, all those words mean. But anyway, the point that I want to make is that uh, the rapture is this important idea. It's made it into pop culture. It's made it into uh, theological systems. It's an important piece of the end times. Uh, so it's important for us then, for all of these reasons, uh, that we turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, the passage in the New Testament that talks about the rapture. Uh, and particularly, uh, I want to bring to mind uh, principles for how to read the Bible well. If you remember back when we began chapter 4, we talked about one of those principles uh, where we need to let Scripture explain Scripture. So that means for a verse like 1 Thessalonians 4.4, 4, uh, where Paul writes, let each man learn to control his own body, with holiness and honor, or let each man learn to acquire his own wife. Those were the two options that we kind of talked through. Uh, we need to let Scripture explain itself. So that means, first of all, we look to the context around the difficult verse. That's called the, the literary context. We want to examine the verses before and the verses after uh, to help understand maybe that particular verse that we're struggling with. So that was the first principle that we looked at then, to let Scripture explain Scripture. Well, tonight I want to bring up a second principle that will help us read the Bible well, and I think it's going to be important as we consider this idea of rapture. Uh, I want us to take a step back from the things that we know about uh, our culture, things from the Left Behind books, or things from uh, different theological systems that we might be familiar with, and let's ask the question, uh, what did the rapture mean to the Thessalonians? What did Paul mean when he wrote about it? And so that principle then, I'll, I'll state it plainly here, is this. That the meaning for us today is what it meant back then. The meaning is what it meant. Uh, this is important. Uh, it brings up this idea uh, not only of literary context, which are the verses surrounding our particular verse, but this idea also of the historical cultural context. I know that's a big phrase, uh, but break it down. It's the, the history, so what life was like back then for the Thessalonians, the culture, uh, what kind of social environment they lived in, different ideas that circulated in that day. Uh, and so that's going to help us then understand um, these, these difficult ideas that maybe even come up in Scripture, this idea of the rapture. Uh, so we ask, what did it mean for them? And that meaning is going to be the same for us today, even if it applies a bit differently. Um, this has been a really helpful tool that I've used to try to read and understand the Bible. Uh, so I want to offer that to you. I want to offer it to us tonight to help us understand this idea of rapture. Uh, so when we hear the word rapture, when we think of this idea, uh, I don't want us to think first of the Left Behind series. I don't want us to think first of uh, whatever theological camp we might fall into. Uh, I want us to think first, when we hear the word rapture, what did it mean for the Thessalonians? What did Paul mean when he wrote about it? Uh, and I think when we think that way, we might be surprised by what we find in Scripture. So let's turn there. Uh, we've prayed. Let's turn now to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. Let's read those together, and then we'll walk through it slowly. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Now, brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who are falling asleep, so that you would not grieve like everyone else who has no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, then we also believe that through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For we say this to you in a word from the Lord, that those of us who remain alive at the coming of the Lord, we will certainly not come before those who have fallen asleep, because the Lord himself, with a command, the voice of an archangel, and the trumpet of God, he will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will be resurrected first. Then those of us who remain alive will be snatched up together with them in the clouds for a meeting with the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is really a great passage. Uh, and I think when we consider the rapture in this context of these verses around it and what it meant for the Thessalonians, we'll see uh, how much comfort, how much encouragement we can draw from this idea. So let's get into these verses. Let's walk through them slowly together. We'll start with verses 13 and 14, which kind of set up the whole idea. Uh, so clearly from these verses, there was confusion in Thessalonica about how the people who had died, maybe within the Christian community, how those people uh, would be affected by the Lord's return. Uh, I think we almost take this for granted because we're so far removed uh, from the first century, from the time when uh, people like the apostles, like Paul, uh, were writing about these things, were um, exploring how Jesus Christ now had uh, changed or now had, had, had brought uh, these elements of theology to light for them. We're so far removed from that that I think we, we take some of these things for granted. But to the, Thessalon to the Thessalonians, uh, this, was, this was new to them, that Christ, the Messiah, had died and come back to life. What all did that mean for their daily lives? And so surely Paul had taught them things, maybe even taught them about this when he was with them, but there was still con some confusion in their community. Uh, when, when Christ returned, what exactly did that mean for the people who had already died? Uh, so that's kind of the question that Paul is dealing with here. Um, he starts these verses with this phrase, um, Now, brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be, in, to be uninformed about. And so these two words, now, about, uh, that's kind of a, a marker of a structure that Paul is using in this, this later part of the letter. Uh, we see it showing up in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 9. It happens here in 13. And then we'll see it again in chapter 5, verse 1. Paul is breaking down three ideas, and he's marking them with this phrase, now about. The first one in 4.9, he says, now about brotherly love. Here he says, now about those who have fallen asleep. Then in chapter 5, he'll say, now about uh, the times and the seasons of Christ's return. So these are three ideas that Paul is addressing, three important topics for the letter. And we'll remember again, as we've referred to, uh, Paul is writing uh, in, in hopes to visit them, but all for the purpose of completing what's lacking in their faith. And so these three topics, I think, are, are things that the Thessalonians need more instruction about, things that maybe they're lacking in right now that Paul wants to complete. And one of those is this understanding of those who have fallen asleep, those who have died, and Christ's return. How are those things going to go together? So first, from these two verses, verses 13 and 14, now, brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who are falling asleep so that you would not grieve like everyone else who has no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, then we also believe that through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. There are two really important points that I think we need to draw out from these opening verses. Uh, first is the, the result, and second is the reason. So notice the result for uh, why Paul is writing about these things. Uh, and this happens in verse 13. We see the result that Paul wants the Thessalonians to grieve differently. Uh, that in response to the sadness of death, he wants the Thessalonians to grieve with hope. And that's because the gospel that we believe in, the gospel that the Thessalonians believed in, it gives us hope for things like death. And even specifically for death, the gospel addresses that with hope. So Paul wants the Thessalonians to grieve with hope. That's the result 
that he wants to see come about in the lives of the Thessalonians. And then for the reason, we see that in verse 14. Uh, The reason is this, the reason for our hope, the reason for the Thessalonians' hope in the face of death is that if Jesus really died and rose again, then those who have died as believers will share that fate, that they, like Christ, will rise again, and that that will happen because of Jesus. It will happen through Him that the believers who have died, they will come back to life. And so that's the hope that we have then as Christians. That was the hope for the Thessalonians is that death is no longer uh, the final enemy. Death no longer has the last say, but that for believers uh, who have died, like Christ, we will rise again. Uh, So those are two two important points. I think Paul really lays the foundation for the rest of the discussion on those two things, the result and the reason. The result being that the Thessalonians would grieve differently, that they would grieve with hope. And the, the reason being because Christ died and came back to life. And then the believers, like Christ, will come back to life when they die. So with that, let's transition now to verses uh, 15, and then we'll touch on the first part of 17 as well. And I want to offer a disclaimer here that um, I will probably bring up more questions than I offer answers. Uh, But in part that's intentional, uh, I don't want to come and and pretend like I've got all the answers myself. I don't want to pretend like I've got everything figured out, when in reality I don't. Uh, I'm wrestling with some of the things that this passage teaches at the same time. So uh, this is really an invitation for us to come together, to think about these things together, to share ideas with one another. And then if a particular question really sparks your interest, dive in, uh, read uh, different people talking about it. Let's come to come to hopefully some conclusions uh, together in community with one another. So um, with verses 15 and 17, uh, let's turn now to see what uh, what those things say. Uh, So verse 15 picks up, For we say this to you in a word from the Lord, that that those of us who remain alive at the coming of the Lord, we will certainly not come before those who have fallen asleep, because the Lord himself, with a command, the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, he will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will be resurrected first. Then those of us who remain alive will be snatched up together with them in the clouds for a meeting with the Lord in the air. Uh, So we see right there that this teaching that Paul's delivering as a word from the Lord, this goes all the way back to Jesus himself. Uh, And if you read this and then go and read Matthew 24 when Jesus gives his uh, what's called the Olivet Discourse. And you'll notice, I think, some some echoes between these two things where we can see that Paul is, is, is applying here the teaching of Jesus himself. Now he says, those of us who remain alive at the coming of the Lord, we will certainly not come before those who have fallen asleep. I think a way we might paraphrase that is that those of us who were alive when Jesus comes back, we will have no special advantage over those who who have died. And so that was one idea maybe that was circulating in the Thessalonians is that those who have died, they're at a disadvantage when Christ comes back because they've already died. Uh, So that would lend to this idea that the people who were alive They're the ones who have first place, or they're the ones who have the upper hand when Christ returns. And Paul's saying, no, 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 not so fast. Now he's going to lay out what will actually happen. We see this this description of the Lord's return, that Jesus will come down from heaven with a, a command, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. So those three elements, uh, some scholars debate whether they're literal or figurative whether when Christ returns we'll actually hear the voice of an archangel shouting or whether we'll actually hear a trumpet or is there some kind of figurative relationship going on here. Uh, So I'll leave that as an open question. Uh, I'm I'm not 100% sure, but I do think uh, it's very interesting, and one one commentator really drew this out for me, to see that uh, these three things, uh, the command, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, these are things that show up throughout the Old Testament and the Old Testament prophets as things that will happen on this day of the Lord. Uh, The prophets talk about this day so often, and uh, many times these three things are mentioned. Uh, So there are uh, references for that. So Paul here is is clearly viewing Christ's return uh, as predicted in the Old Testament. And he's saying that's exactly uh, how it will be when Christ returns. He's drawing on these Old Testament passages. 
Uh, this same commentator also explained that uh, here in these verses when it mentions that uh, the dead who will be resurrected first, um, this is another area where, where questions come up. Uh, so one commentator explained that these are the bodies of the believers who have died. Their bodies are being resurrected first when in reality their souls are coming down out of heaven with Jesus. That um, I think he's probably drawing on the verse that says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Uh, so I think in, in this perspective that uh, when a believer dies, their soul immediately joins Christ in an intermediate state, it's called, uh, and their body goes into the ground. Then when Christ returns, the soul of the believer is with Christ and their body is resurrected. And so then at this this rapture, at this meeting with the Lord, it's the, 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 the joining maybe of the soul back to the body and then the, the glorified bodies being given. But uh, again, this raises a lot of questions. So for now, let's step back and let's uh, just read along with Paul to see the argument that he's building here. Remember, he's, he's targeting specifically this issue of those who are alive when Christ returns and those who are dead when Christ returns. Um, or those who have already died when Christ returns. How are, uh, how's the relationship working out here? Um, and we see that the, the pinnacle then that Paul is writing about, uh, these verses climax with the rapture, that after the dead are raised, uh, we who are alive, Paul says, will be snatched up to the clouds for a meeting with the Lord in the air. And this is, uh, this is the rapture. Uh, this is this idea that's made it uh, into culture in all these various ways, I want us uh, for this moment to step back and let's think about uh, what this text says, what these verses say that maybe challenge some of our assumptions about the rapture. So again, I'm not giving many answers here. Uh, really, I'm raising questions. I think this is a fascinating passage. We'll land where Paul lands with encouragement and hope. Uh, but for right now, I want to just make some observations about what Paul says about the rapture and how that might challenge some of our assumptions. So for one, in these verses, uh, we see that the rapture doesn't come first. Uh, if your imagination is like mine, I tend to think that um, people are just disappearing out of nowhere. Um, that, you know, there are two people in a room and one of them suddenly disappears. Uh, that's, the, that's the rapture. And there are verses that maybe give this idea, again, like verses from Matthew, where I think also in Matthew 24, Jesus will say that uh, there will be two people in the field, one will be left and the other taken. Um, so that's another passage we might want to, to go to after reading 1 Thessalonians 4 uh, to try to build you know, a, maybe a system or worldview of our own to understand how these two passages can go together. Uh, but for now, right in 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, if we work through the text carefully, we see that uh, in, in Paul's logic in 1 Thessalonians 4, other things are happening before the rapture happens. First, the Lord is descending from heaven uh, there's the cry of command, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God. Then the dead are raised. And then very clearly Paul says, then we who are alive will be caught up to heaven with them. Uh, so the rapture then happens after these other events have taken place. So that's one thing that we might want to observe. One thing we might want to consider when we're forming our own understanding of the rapture. Second, uh, the text doesn't tell us what happens next. Um... It seems almost commonplace that uh, right after the rapture, believers are just taken away to heaven. Uh, Paul does say after that verse that we'll be with the Lord then forever. Uh, that was one view of the, the commentator that I read. Uh, but I think it's interesting to note that the text uh, doesn't tell us directly. Uh, I know of at least one other view that when the rapture happens, when these believers are there meeting the Lord in the air, that they actually then come down to earth and all the believers are the um, uh, like the triumphal procession then. They're, they're escorting, uh, that's the better word, they're escorting King Jesus back to earth uh, to claim authority and dominion, something like that. So that's at least one other view. Uh, so I want to, again, not land on a firm answer. Like I said, I'm still working through some of these ideas myself. Ultimately, I want us to read the text, uh, pull out Paul's argument, what's he saying here, and then we'll apply that argument to our lives. So those are some things, again, about the raptures. We're forming our own view. Let's think carefully about the text of Scripture and not make assumptions based off of um, 
things like uh, different book series or TV shows that we've seen. Let's go back to the Bible and let's formulate our views based from that. And so uh, here in 1 Thessalonians 4, then we see these things that might challenge some of our assumptions about the rapture. But then uh, we, we land, we end in verses 17 and 18, uh, where Paul says this. He says, And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Uh, so this this teaching about the rapture, about the end times uh, for the Christian, this is so much hope. This is so much encouragement uh, that we have the victory, that death is not the final word for us. We have reason to celebrate, reason to, to be encouraged. Uh, and we have the reason why, that we will be with the Lord forever. Uh, so let that be uh, the takeaway uh, that we will be with the Lord forever. But I think we can make a few more observations, a few more areas of application for our lives. Uh, we've seen that Paul is writing to this issue that the Thessalonians are confused about. They know people who have died. They want to know what's going to happen to those people when Christ returns. So Paul addresses that question. He lays it out that they will be resurrected first. Then we who are alive will all go up in the, in the air, in the sky, to meet Jesus and he doesn't give us more after that. He just says that's what will that's happen. Now we can turn to other passages, uh, but here Paul's writing this particular issue. Um, and so I think we can, um, we, can, we can land there with Paul to see his argument there. He's writing to encourage the Thessalonians and to tell them, keep encouraging one another uh, with this teaching. So first of all then, as a way of application, we can be encouraging. Uh, I think sadly... I see many people arguing different positions for their view of the end times. Uh, but here, Paul is saying that our understanding of what's going to happen at the end of the world, that should be a ground for encouraging one another, not for arguing with one another. Uh, so let that be a question for us. Does our view of the end times lead to encouraging one another? Or do we want to argue fine details or fine points? Uh, so let's be encouraging, first of all. Second, uh, be comforted, be hopeful. Uh, we have so much to hope in from this teaching that we will be with Christ forever. So even amidst fears about the coronavirus, even when I think for many of us death has become a reality that's right in front of our face, uh, even in the face of death, brothers and sisters, we can be encouraged uh, that death is not the final word for us. Even when we grieve from the sadness of death, we grieve with glory in mind, uh, that we have the hope of heaven forever, uh, the presence of the Lord Jesus to look forward to. And then lastly, that leads to our last point of application, uh, that we should be evangelistic. Uh, if we can be, um, we can be encouraging, we can uh, be comforted, and we can be evangelistic. At the end of the day, Christianity, this message about Christ, is the only hope that we have uh, not just us, but the only hope that anyone has for death. There is no other idea, no other solution for the sadness and the pain of death apart from Christianity. So let's take this message of hope, this message that's for all people, let's take it to them uh, and invite them into the joy and the hope that we have in Christ. So I'll pray that over us this week, and I look forward to seeing you on Sunday. So let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead, who has come to have first place over everything. Father, we worship you. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters that, Lord, you would encourage us, that you would use us to encourage one another to hold fast until Christ returns. God, keep my brothers and sisters strong in the faith. Keep them growing in you. Father, I pray for opportunities to shine your light, to show your love to other people. Uh, God, help us to be evangelistic. Father, help us to be people who spread the gospel like a farmer would scatter seed. Father, help us to sow far and wide the seed of the gospel. And Father, bring many people into this hope and into this joy that we have. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, I'll see y'all on Sunday. I look forward to it. Have a great week.